Hello and welcome to Co-Produce Care. Today we have with us Martin Green, Professor Martin Green, who is the CEO of Care England. Um, and before we kick off, I'd like to just ask you if you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe, please like our content and feel free to share anything that we put out. So without further ado, welcome Martin. Thanks very much, Sophie. Thank you for coming on Co-Produce Care. Um, so when we start our interviews, we usually like to know a bit about the person. Mm. We know that you're CEO of Care England, and we'll learn about that a little bit more later. Yeah. But firstly, can you just give us a bit of a flavour of how you got into social care? Well, I really started working in social care when I was at school. I did an O-level and an A-level in sociology, and part of that was about working and supporting a, a physical disabled person's home. And so I did some work in that area, and I really enjoyed particularly the interaction Interaction with the people who lived in the care home. I'm really interested though to remember what it was like all those years ago and how things have changed between then and now but that really was the thing that sparked my interest in uh, social care. And um, Care England, that's one of the largest independent provider um, associations in the UK. What does Care England do? Well we hope that we represent the social care sector and we represent them to what I would describe as key stakeholders. So for example the government at both national and local level, we represent them to the media so we're trying to get a good positive approach to media relations for the care sector. But I also hope that we provide a range of very tangible things that are helpful to people who are running care services. So we have good information services, we also have a range of what might be described as practical things that can help reduce the costs of delivering care, which then helps care providers deliver much more resource into the front line of care provision. So those are our real major, um, I think, contributions to care. Great. Um, so what we've done, we've gone out to social media and we've told people that you are coming on a co-produced care chat. We've asked for a few questions and we've had a decent amount. So I'm going to go straight into questions that people have been asking. One of the first questions is from um, Annalyn Elper and she has asked what are your current challenges and how do you deal with those challenges? I think the biggest challenge is to get social care onto the agenda of government and to get a long-term and sustainable funding settlement. Though of course there's also the challenge of how we recruit, retain, respect and reward our wonderful staff and we've got to move this to being a career rather than just being seen as a job. And I would say getting this on the agenda of government so that it's properly resourced and ensuring that we have the right number of the right quality of people in our sector, those are the two major challenges for Care England. Yeah. Um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, asked Lauren Stacey, on recruitment challenges um, in social care. So have you got any ideas of how we can attract people into the sector? Well, one of the things I think we've got to do is be far more flexible about how we um, deliver care. One of the things about social care is it's a 24-hour, 365-day profession. So if we can offer people more flexible working, I think we can attract into our sector a lot of people who make a really valuable contribution. And they may be able to, for example, juggle a role in care with their own personal care and responsibilities, or indeed with being a student or developing their education. So I think what we've got to do as a sector is start recognising that there are a range of people who can make a huge contribution as long as we deliver a more flexible approach to care um, and, and giving different jobs and roles. Um, so there's been a lot of talk um, in politics and in the media about um, qualifications for social care workers. So this question comes from Chris Wellens um, and they're asking to know your thoughts on qualified managers in health and social care and then being re recognised by HCPC which I didn't know but I looked up and that's the Health and Care Professions Council um, and that council regulate, regulates health and care professions such as art therapists, dietitians, paramedics, speech and language therapists. So it regulates some people who have connection with health and social care, but not um, managers. So do you think that it would be a good idea maybe to include them um, 
in, in the professions that they regulate? I think it would be great and I really want to advocate for a registered profession. I want us to have proper career pathways. I want us to acknowledge the qualifications and competencies framework that people will need to deliver proper level social care. And I think we should also realise that if you deliver social care really effectively, you're enabling and empowering the people who use services. And this is a very complex role. And I think we need to start recognising it as complex. We need to give people who work in social care the status of professionals because they are professionals. And we need to have a registration process that will enable people to get the status that their profession deserves. So it's more than just being regulated, it's actually being registered and recognised. So there's a whole idea around um, helping people to feel valued by having registration I suppose. Yes very much so and if you look at some of those professions that the, um, uh, the council currently regulate they're professions that not only have a degree of clarity about their training and uh, uh, qualifications framework mm -hmm. but they also have a degree of status with the general public and with others and I want to make sure that both those things both the qualifications the competencies and the status are brought into social care. Yeah. Um, so John Hoskinson asks, what models of provision of care should there be in the future? Well, I think one of the things we've got to do is start modernising our models of care. We need to recognise the diversity of people who use services and we need to realise that one size fits all is no longer appropriate for the 21st century. What I'd like to see is much more innovation and creativity and also blended approaches to social care so that people can get the services that support them when they need them. And so I think there is a real opportunity for us to start thinking creatively about how we develop care in the future. Mm. Um, have you got any examples of what you think might be a, a different model or models that are sort of being introduced by uh, vanguards of the area at the moment that you think are good examples of the way forward? Well I'd like to see care homes become the hubs for the management and support of long-term conditions. Now I've seen examples where a care home opened up a range of support services in the day for people in their locality. They also produced some night support services for people living with dementia. They produced some carers support services. It was also noticeable in that case that a lot of the people who were caring for people living with dementia were older themselves so what was happening was as the person was bringing their uh, relative or loved one to the service they were also bringing their laundry and then perhaps the next morning collecting the laundry as well as the person they support so I think we've got to see these care homes as real centres and community hubs and that would also help with the prevention agenda. I think for a care provider's point of view, it provides a real connection with local communities and it will then provide a range of new people who might want to use their services in the future. So this really is a win-win for people who use services and also for care providers. And what about people who are being cared for who aren't? Um, maybe suitable for a care home environment, people, younger people, people with learned disabilities. Um, do you think there should be different models of care for those types of individuals? Well essentially I think we should have one starting point for every model of care and that's about how we support people appropriately mm -hmm. and one of the things that I would like to see is that I think there are some brilliant models in learning disabilities which are really enabling models and we need to transfer those into older people's care as well. You know, people are people and there should not be an arbitrary cut-off based on your age as to what service you get. So what I'd like to see is a complete understanding that we start from the premise of delivering what people need and that shouldn't be constrained by whether or not you're 60 or 16. Um, and then another connected question from John again is, what do you think is the likelihood of health and social care being integrated under this government? Well the first thing I want to do is reclaim the term integration. The problem with governments is they talk about integration and they talk about it in relation to the NHS, to local authorities and sometimes to care providers. Mm -hmm. That misses the point completely. True integration is about how a service user experiences the service. Now as I use often the uh, model of the airline industry, when I sit on an aeroplane I do not know when 
when I leave Austrian airspace and go into German airspace. There is a massive process going on in the background, but what I experience is a flight from A to B. Now this is the holy grail of an integrated process. If I asked a service user whether they'd had a good service and they said to me yes, and then I asked the supplementary question, who provided it, and they told me they didn't know, well that to me would be a success tick in the integration box. But I think we have to recalibrate the conversation about integration and start from a different place. The, the conversation at the moment always starts with the organisations and structures, and I want to start with people and outcomes. Yeah. Um... So I suppose in order to start with people and outcomes, you really need to be looking at services from the person's point of view. Mm. Um, obviously we're poor co-produced care, um, we're very keen on co-production, but doing things co-productively can take time and resources. Do you think that involving people with lived experience in the process of integration or service change is even practical or possible in health and social care? I think it's both practical and possible, but it requires us to shift our mindset and it also requires us to recognise, like anything, that you might have to put some investment into that to enable people to be able to put their views in ways that help us to deliver services that are appropriate for them. One of the things I found though is that if you start talking to people who use services about what they need and what they want, they're often the lower level things that make a difference. So I think if you look across the piece, if you start doing co-produced services, you might find that you're saving resources in some areas, though you might need to put a little bit of upfront resource in the enabling process so that people are first of all enabled to identify their views and put them in a way that is helpful to the development of the service. That's really interesting. So actually you might think it's more expensive, but in the long run you might be saving money because you're actually meeting someone's need. Um, so, so this is moving on to smaller providers, this question. Um, and the question is, what experience are smaller providers having in meeting the criteria for going digital and joining up with health authorities? So um, this is a question from Barbara and she's thinking uh, about Care Connect program um, and the challenge providers face with limited IT support in meeting the basic criteria. I think it's a big challenge for smaller organisations. In larger organisations there's often an infrastructure that helps people to become more engaged with technology. <clears throat> One of the things that we've done at Care England is we've appointed an officer who's doing work on IT, trying to encourage people to get on NHS mail for example to make sure that information is transferred. And I think we should also recognise though that one of the things that often happens when, for example, GPs needed to go technical and go into the digital age, the government pumped enormous amounts of money into them. That never happens in social care. What we usually get are small amounts of money in pilot form, rather than bigger amounts of money which are available to the whole sector. So I don't underestimate the challenges for smaller providers of becoming digital. But what I would say to them is, this is a classic case where if you do put the time, the money and the energy into going digital, I think further down the line you will find it will make significant savings and make your job much easier and hopefully with the transfer of information it will also be, enable you to make a much more bespoke approach to how you support people uh, who are living in your services. So the next question is from Joanne Zamori. Um, and the question is about the regulator of health and social care, which is the Care Quality Commission, short to CQC. Um, and they're asking how effective is CQC in regulating social care services? That's the first part of the question. Second part is um, how do you think it can improve or stop institutional abuses being um, happening on a huge scale? Well, I think the first thing to say is I think we've got the regulatory model wrong. I think what we've done is we've focused the regulatory model on snapshots and also on processes. So you can get through a regulatory regime by ticking all the boxes around the structure and the administration. But actually, what we need to know is whether or not this service is delivering an outcome for the people who use it.
I also think we need to move to a far less judgmental approach to regulation. So one of the problems is that we focus on trying to find things that are going wrong with the system. What I'd much rather do is look at that in the perspective of saying, how do we learn from experience and make sure that it doesn't happen again? And I think the airline industry, again, has a lot to teach us because they have a critical incident approach to any challenge they look at it, they say what lessons can be learned and then they make sure those lessons are learned by the whole sector. So that's something that I'd like to see, the, the, the approach to regulation in social care. Now in relation to the challenges, I think one of the problems is that in any regulatory regime, that if you rely on one visit every year or every two years or in some cases every three years, mm -hmm. you're not going to get a feel for what's going on in the service. What I think we've got to do is we've got to move to a much more data-driven approach to regulation. Now I've seen some good examples and in fact there is a Care England member who has got an absolutely fantastic uh, and very, very comprehensive approach to how they deliver their services. So a good example of this, I was in an office and one of the care plans said that the person liked to go swimming on a Wednesday. This was attached to a data Point so that they knew that the car that was going to take this person had not left the building. So somebody said, why hasn't Jane left for her swimming? Mm -hmm. And then the response was, well, she doesn't want to go today, which is quite legitimate. But then the response was, well, you should have amended the care plan then. Mm -hmm. So this was a way of showing through data that the care quality was being delivered and that people's care plans were being delivered. Mm -hmm. So I think in the future we're going to see much more of that and what I want to see is the use of data so that we have a real time rather than a snapshot view of quality and we have a consistent long term minute by minute view of the experiences of people who live in care services. So the only question I suppose I have from that is with collecting all this data and with technology and uh, recording everything and every outcome that people are, uh, are receiving, does it get a little bit like Big Brother where rather than just being a caring service that's meeting somebody's needs and it's a very personal service, we are just collecting all this data, recording what we're doing um, and it moves away from being a, a very personal service that care sort of innately is. Well, I think that's a useful challenge and I think we need to be mindful that it can be misused in that way. But I think if we engage people, and particularly the people who use services, in why we're collecting the data, also give them the understanding about what outcomes and impacts it will have on the improvement of their services or the quality of their life. And also, if we respect them enough to say that if they say no, well then we respect that. But I think also I have a real view that sometimes we infantilise people who are living in care services or receiving care services. So if somebody says no, and there may be a consequence of saying no, we need to spell that out to them so they're really clear and have all the information on which to make an informed decision. Mm, yeah. <coughs> um, so now we're going to move on to the big question of funding. Um, so Joanne also asks, what is being done to improve funding for the care sector as a whole? Well, we're certainly trying to get the government to understand that they need to put more money into the care sector, but unfortunately they are very reluctant to see the care sector as being important in relation to both funding it and also giving it a long-term sustainable funding. Um, interestingly, the election campaign that we just had was dominated by the NHS and the perspective that was presented was that the NHS hadn't got enough funding. Now in fact the NHS has got enormous amounts of funding and if you have a situation where you tell everybody we've got an integrated health and social care service and we've got a department that's changed its name and said they're integrated and yet we have one bit of the system that has about 185 billion in it and another bit of the system that has 16 billion in it you can quite see the inequalities there. What we also need to realise is that the 21st century is characterised by people who live with a multiple layer of conditions. So long-term conditions and how we support people is the issue of the 21st century, yet our funding regimes have not kept pace with that. And if we were going to respond now and start life from year zero, we would not have that vastly disproportionate funding in the NHS compared to what there is in social care.
Why do you think the NHS or even the election campaigns were talking, or the manifesto were talking about funding the NHS? It's already got so much money. Is it that they there's misuse in the system um, and there needs to be more efficiencies? Um, because obviously there's this disparity between health funding and care funding. Um, do you think there's an issue with how money is being used in the NHS? I definitely think there is, and I think we need a public conversation about what the NHS is there to achieve. Now, of course, the NHS is a brilliant institution. It's done enormous amounts for a lot of people. We know all of us, we engage with the NHS. But our problem is that we don't now critically examine what it's doing, why it's doing it, <clears throat> or indeed how much money it's taking to do it. Interestingly, I was giving a speech recently about the position of social care and why people don't engage with it. <clears throat> and I looked at my television <clears throat> and I saw that on one day there was <clears throat> GPs behind closed doors. Emma Willis delivers babies, one born every minute, inside the surgery unit, uh, 24 hours in A&E, inside the ambulance. This is on one day. These are organisations in the media who are presenting the NHS to the public. So that is why, as well, the, the public have this view about the NHS. And it's quite interesting. <clears throat> One of the things that happens is if there is a scandal in the NHS, the default position of the public is to say the government hasn't given them enough money. If there's a scandal in social care, the default position is to say those greedy providers have taken all the money. Well, actually, we need a more adult conversation. This is not a Punch and Judy show. This is about people's lives, and we need to have a proper conversation about how we fund social care into the future so that people as citizens understand what they have to contribute, but also have an expectation about what they'll get when they get to social care and unfortunately often people only come to social care when it's a crisis and they have no knowledge about the system because they assume it's like the NHS. Mm -hmm. I was a uh I work for a social care organisation and we got a lovely compliment letter from somebody and they called us the fourth emergency service and uh, I really touched my heart but then it made me think about the sector and that normally is how it is. Um, if people can't get hold of the other emergency services or it's not quite as important as that then they do go to social care. So it is important to have a bit more uh, parity of steam, if you like, between the two. Yeah, and I, I, my view is that we should be seen as part of national infrastructure, mm -hmm. and that's how we should be regarded by both government and citizens. Yeah, and there's also talk about um, understanding what social care actually is mm -hmm. and what it does to people uh, and to the whole s people's lives and to health um, as well, because in terms of supporting it because a lot of the talk at the moment is about making social care more like the NHS, more like health. We need to upskill people to be look and feel more like a health service, mm -hmm. when actually social care itself has its own skills and it has its own um, professions uh, and positives. So there's probably a whole debate that needs to be had around that. No, I agree. Okay, so the next question is from Edge Training, um, and they want to talk uh, about deprivation of liberty safeguards. So mm -hmm. they're changing to the liberty protection safeguards and their question is um, what are your thoughts on local authorities asking care homes to commission and arrange assessments under the new uh, dolls LPS are they prepared for this so are uh, care homes prepared for this change well first of all I don't think care homes are prepared for this change but also I would argue that I think this is not a very helpful change because it is in effect people marking their own homework and also we have a situation where when this was brought in local authorities were given shed loads of money to set up departments many of which failed miserably and yet when they're going to transfer this to care homes they're not putting shed loads of money into the process. So I think there's an issue about whether or not it's going to be shall we say independent but there's also an issue about how we get the sector ready and train and support and also how we backfill when people are doing this work so I think there are a lot of questions that have not been answered and I think this was just a money saving exercise and partly it was because the people who'd failed were local authorities and when local authorities fail there is a direct route to politicians and they don't like the failure train hitting the bottom of their desk so what they like to do is then transfer it to somebody else so that when it goes wrong they can blame somebody else. Well that sounds very cynical but I wouldn't be too, <laughs> too surprised if that's very similar to the truth. Um, 
But I know from talking to care providers and registered managers, you know, there's this duty, this new responsibility, and like you say, people just not being very well equipped or advised on it. Um, I think it's definitely going to come up as a, as a new issue for 2020. No, I think it is, and actually, I think it's something. It's a pertinent reminder for Care England that we need to do our bit in making sure people understand yeah. what the new processes are. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so now we've come on to the section of our interview where we ask cactus questions. Okay. I don't have the cactus with us at the moment, but um, they are prickly questions about health and social care. Um, and the first one is from David Smollacombe from Care and Support West, Care Association in Bristol. Um, and he asks, uh, how is your relationship with Boris? Um, obviously we're just out of uh, election period, we've got Conservative government um, and he wants to know how that relationship is developing and what are your hopes for any changes in social care funding from the new government? Well, I would say the relationship with the Prime Minister is very much in the development stage and partly that's because no nothing has been on his desk other than Brexit since he became Prime Minister. It'll be interesting to see when we get past the end of January and we've gone past the point of a form of Brexit, whether or not the government starts to focus its attention on some of the other issues. <clears throat> What's quite interesting is that they have talked about things like economic uh, positions in those constituencies that went from red to blue in the election and the Prime Minister talked about what he was going to do for those constituencies who had loaned him their vote. Well in lots of those constituencies social care is the biggest employer and is a major part of those local economies. So I think what government need to do is recognise the importance of social care to the people who are the recipients of it, to the people who are supported, but they should also know that social care is in many local areas the most important economic driver. People who work in social care live locally, they, they spend their money in local businesses and shops and they sustain local economies. So there is a really imperative for government to address this issue from the perspective of people who get support, but also because of its importance in local economies. Um, the next question is about the private and voluntary <coughs> sector debate. Mm -hmm. So uh, Care England uh, supports private providers, if I'm right in saying? No, we have lots of charitable providers charitable, okay. as well. So sometimes there's a debate where people think social care should just be provided by voluntary organisations and not by uh, private organisations who may be making a profit. What are your thoughts about that, uh, that issue? Do you think that there should be a certain type of provider that should be providing these services or does that really matter? Well certainly I don't think it matters. I think we are too hooked up with the legal structure of organisations. I never hear a service user say to me, oh the biggest concern I have is that this is a charity or this is a business. What they do is they talk about the services they receive and how they are supported. And I think the whole issue about whether or not it's charitable or whether or not it's business is a complete irrelevancy. I want sector neutrality and I want people to be judged on what they deliver, not how they're structured or how they're managed. And the issue as well about whether or not people make profit. The reality is that if you don't make profit, you haven't got a sustainable business. And I could argue that huge amounts of the public sector, the surplus value just gets divvied up amongst the staff in things like in the NHS, very uh, large pension fund contributions, for example. So I think what we should realise is that we have a plural economy of care, that we shouldn't be too bothered about whether or not it's private charitable or public, but we should be focusing on is it delivering, and I think some clear measures, which is outcomes to the person who used the services and efficient use of the resources. Those are the two issues that we should be focused on, rather than is it registered with the Charity Commission, Companies House or a government body. Um, and the Green Paper. We still haven't had the Green Paper. Will we ever have the Green Paper? I don't know. But if we were to have green paper, what three main, I 
things would you expect from a green paper? Well, the first thing to say is, frankly, I don't think we need a green paper. The bottom line is we have spent the last 21 years inquiring into the problem and need, now people need to start thinking about the solution. We know the challenges in social care. They're about funding. They're about flexibility. They're about how we recruit, retain and train our staff. These are the big issues. We know what they are. We know some of the solutions to them. And what we expect is a government with an 80 seat majority to just get on and do something rather than endlessly talk about it. I was very interested in the Prime Minister's comment that he was going to seek a political consensus. Well, the answer to that is why. You know, the bottom line is if you have 80 seat majority, it is your responsibility to govern. And what they talked about with the political consensus was at a time when you had to have political consensus to get anything done. Well, now that time has passed. So what we expect is less talk and more delivery. So in a couple of months' time, we'll be interviewing Caroline Dynage, who's Minister of Care, um, and I wanted to find out if you had any questions that we should be asking Caroline. Well, I think I would ask her, since the Department of Health changed its name to the Department of Health and Social Care, can she point at any tangible outcomes that have been delivered by this new department? Can she show us how the Department of Health and Social Care is now seeing an integrated system? Or are there, is there any evidence that this new role has delivered anything for social care? Hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. That was a fantastic interview. Um, thank you for joining us at Co-Produce Care. Uh, thank you very much.